Hi, and welcome to this live reading from The Apothecary's Curse by Barbara Barnett. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue, London, 1902. My dear friend, hold fast the doctrine. When all impossibilities are eliminated, what remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Nothing could be so improbable that I must now and forever address you as Sir Arthur. Dr. Joseph Bell stood at the head of the dining table before 20 assembled guests, offering a robust toast to the guest of honor, his student and friend, the newly knighted Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in London for the first time since the honor had been bestowed on him. His confidant, Jean Elizabeth Lecky, was at his side. Do tell, Sir Arthur, Mrs. Wilder said with a giggle. Is it not true that our dear Joseph is in actuality your Sherlock Holmes? Indeed not, Mrs. Wilder. The author twisted his mustache a bit more at each mention of Holmes's name. Miss Lecky patted Conan Doyle's arm tenderly. My dear, your mustache shall soon be as fine as a strand of silk. Besides, you well know he is. They even smoke the same sort of pipe. The entire table joined her in laughter, despite Conan Doyle's protestations. Ah, interrupted Joseph, coming to Conan Doyle's rescue. Alas, I do not share Holmes's preference for cocaine, nor does my mind crave the constant stimulation of work. I am quite at peace come Sunday afternoons with nothing to do but read the Times. I wish my consulting detective could rest in peace. Conan Doyle scowled at Mrs. Wilder as she inquired when a new Holmes story would be published. Did you not read the final problem, my dear Mrs. Wilder? Holmes died at Reichensbach Fit Falls. However, since no one will allow him to be at his rest, he sighed dramatically, I can tonight announce a new adventure for the Strand come next year. The Empty House, it is called. Conan Doyle laughed, yet it was darkened with an unmistakable note of vexation. But how should you have him come back, Sir Arthur? Mr. Cranford inquired. If he is indeed, as you say, dead. Do let us change the subject, Mr. Cranford. Conan Doyle lifted his glass, taking a long draft of his wine. His eyes closed. Miss Lecky smiled. Oh, I've something. Have you heard of that apothecary? Lentine is his name, in Convent, Convent Garden. The line to enter his shop goes on and on. Can you imagine? And why might that be, Miss Lecky? Conan Doyle asked. Why, his amazing reanimating mercuric tonic, of course. To hear his patter, the medicine shall restore life even in the event of sudden death. Can you imagine? An apothecary of all ludicrous things. Mr. Cranford laughed. They should hang them all, the thieving rogues. I've never met one I can trust, always trying to hawk the latest patent medicines. Galen Ecredune glared at Miss Lecky, his dark, mirthless eyes hard as basalt. Beside him, his companion, Joseph's cousin, Dr. Simon Bell, laid a calming hand on his sleeve, an urgent plea to forbear. Galen snapped his arm away. With a peevish edge to his voice, Galen steered the topic from the dubiousness of the apothecary trade. What if your consulting detective cannot die? Conan Doyle stared him down. Whatever do you mean cannot die? Simon worried a loose thread in his linen napkin. His hands nodded with tension. Yes, Galen continued, ignoring Simon's disquiet. Well, after Reichenbach, Holmes is, of course, presumed dead, his body not found. Unsurprising, given the terrain, but I assume your new story finds him quite well. Um, might you not suggest, therefore, that Holmes's invulnerability extends beyond the intellectual? That he, in fact, cannot die by any natural means, improbable though it may seem? Although you have toyed with the notion, you are Sorsa in the Ring of Thoth, you needn't ever be explicit, of course. Allow your readers to speculate and draw their own conclusions. Holmes's devotees will be so elated that none shall even question how it is possible. He mimed a vaudeville marquee with his hands high above his head, commanding the attention of the entire table. 
The immortal Sherlock Holmes lives on in a new series. At once, self-conscious, Galen thrusts his deformed left hand into his trouser pocket. You'll live forever, by Jove. Your creation shall, perhaps long after you, sir, have gone to your grave. Conan Doyle's enthusiasm seemed tepid at best, but Galen pressed further. As well, do you not imagine, sir, whilst giving new life to your most popular creation, you might also draw upon your truest passion, the supernatural world? Would that na not, as it were, be killing two birds with one stone? Ha! <laughs> Conan Doyle pointed an accusatory finger at Gang Galen. You, sir, sound too much like my publisher. Joseph broke in. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let us go through to the drawing room. We might continue our conversations there in more comfort, but Conan Doyle was not to be stopped. In a moment, Dr. Bell, he said, holding up his hand to forestall the company. I have a question for Mr. Urkeldoon. Our dear Joseph made mention that you are an apothecary. Simon backed farther into his chair, cursing himself that he had disclosed even this small fact to his ever curious cousin. He twisted his napkin, eyes pleading with Galen to be still. Galen leaned toward Conan Doyle, a th vague threat in the set of his jaw. That I am, but why is that of concern to you or anyone here this evening? Do you mean to put me in my place as amongst the same company as Lentine, whom Miss Lecky has just now vilified, and with ample cause, I might add? I mean no disrespect, not nor to dishonor you amongst the fine physicians at this table. I, I am curious, and that is all. Conan Doyle paused a moment, as if to consider something. I understand, sir, that many apothecaries in eras past were adept in alchemy, even magic. Galen settled back into his chair by a degree, coiled as a snake. That, sir, may have been more the case, say, centuries ago, a blurring of the lines. However, Sir Arthur, I possess no personal knowledge, for example, of any apothecary or druggist nowadays claiming to hold in his hands the secrets of life through alchemical ab abracadabra, if that is what you are suggesting. As for myself, I am quite well tutored in chemistry and toxicology and a principal of periclesis. Many of his dicta still ring true for me. Sola dosis facit venenum. The dose makes the poison. Parcelus says coined that in the 16th century, today it is an axiom of modern pharmacy. He was both an apothecary and an alchemist and a physician. I would consider myself an esteemed company to associate myself with his understanding of alchemy. He had neither desire to make gold from lead nor to find the elusive lapis philosophorum, but only to reveal the medicinal science it concealed by its art. Conan Doyle leaned forward confidentially as if the rest of the company had vanished. I have no desire, sir, to offend you. Forgive me if my questions seem more interrogation than polite dinner conversation. I am first and foremost a journalist, but my ardent interest in per is personal and much to do with my curiosity about the occult, as you may have guessed. I am quite sad to think about how much of the ancient arts were lost or have gone into hiding along with their knowledge. Our ideas must be as broad as nature if they are to interpret nature, at and if ideas, no matter how unusual they seem to our modern sensibilities, are destroyed and visionaries burnt, either literally or metaphorically, at the stake, we stand not a chance. And by the way, sir, I must av avert that you are only one of a very few to have read Thoth. But to your point regarding our natural fear of the unusual, on that, sir, at least, Galen said, we might agree. Let us then, if we may, Sir Arthur, Joseph repeated, clearing his throat, go through to the drawing room. Miss Leckie, would you do us the honor of leading the way? But of course, she agreed, patting Conan Doyle's hand affectionately. Shall we, my dear? She rose and the rest of the company followed her from the room. Galen and Conan Doyle found themselves in a secluded corner of the large drawing room as the other guests mingled. Simon stood nearby, gesturing with growing disquietude that they should leave, and quite soon. Galen turned his back on him as Conan Doyle leaned in again. By the by, sir, I do recognize your unusual name, Urkeldoon, 
I have come across it on occasion in my research into the other world. The other world. Indeed, where the fey folk rule. I've heard of an Eckledoom associated with the legends of old, a certain Thomas Learmont de Eckledoom, a relationship with Tuatha de Danon, the <laughs> fairy folk Sir Arthur. Galen managed a laugh. You, sir, hold me in exalted company, and I am sorry to disappoint you. However, it is said that this man, Urkeldoon, had a book possessing great power given him by Ermid herself, Celtic goddess of healing, a gift for his act of kindness. Have you not heard the tale? My family, although it may be Sir Arthur, boasts neither connection with the goddess Ermid nor any of her folk, the Tuatha de Danon, if indeed they ever existed. Besides, was not Ermid an Irish fairy? And I am, as you are, sir, of Scottish blood. Galen glanced around the room again, finding Simon's anxious eyes beseeching him to end the exchange. We'd best join the rest of the company. I see my dear friend Simon is quite unsettled, and we ought to soon set off for... It is a book of great healing, Conan Doyle continued. All the diseases of the world and their cures held in a single volume, said to be written by her very hand. Galen paused, a petulant sigh escaping his lips. I cannot say I can recall its mention, even amongst family lore. His lips tightened into a tense line as he stood. Now, if you will excuse me, sir, I grow tired and fear it is time Dr. Simon Bell and I return to his flat. Have you done enough damage for one visit? Simon's ice gray glare drilled into Galen as they warmed themselves before Simon's fireplace. What do you mean? Galen held his hands up to the blaze, suppressing a wince as a sharp pain threaded through his left hand. Unrepentant, he sighed, yet he understood Simon's displeasure. I was bored. The chatter of the rich and idle was more than I could handle. I'd forgotten how lifeless it could be. It is not what I meant. I could not abide that insipid Miss Lucky and her tirade, all their tirades against those of my trade. Do you disagree about Lentine? You know I do not. But to classify the whole of the apothecary trade as a society of rogues and street mountebacks. Simon rose from his chair and paced in a small line, hands behind his back, tone clipped. So for that, you had to provide Sir Arthur at his celebration? Grabbing a poker, he stabbed at the hearth as if it were a dragon. And he, St. George. Had I not gotten them off that subject, I do not know what I might have done. The warmth of the fireplace, the aromatic burning of the tinder and cigars did nothing to diffuse the piercing pain that throbbed along the edge of his knuckles and beyond them, into the empty space where long ago existed three fingers. Eyes clamped shut, Galen sucked in a breath, trying to ride out the relentless assault he knew was but a phantom. You might think after all this time it would not bother me still, but it does, oddly, as if the fingers were yet attached. Simon's annoyance dissipated as he came near to examine Galen's hand. And suggesting that Sherlock Holmes is somehow immortal was an imp improvement. He prodded the smooth stump with his thumbs and Galen grimaced with each touch. I've some fresh ground ganja powder. A cup of tea from it might make it more bearable unless you prefer something stronger. The kettle should be ready by now. Thank you, tea would be fine. The mere anticipation of relief began to soften the knife-sharp pain. Given that Sir Arthur is a journalist and has a particular interest in anything that seems to defy the laws of nature, Simon continued, returning from the other room with the tea service, handing Galen a delicate china cup. I must say his line of questioning triggered by your own provocation was disquieting, to say the least. The warmth of the cup permeated Galen's hand as he savored the tea, more soothing than the finest whiskey. Thank you, Simon. Already the pain dissipates. It seemed quite fitting to offer the idea about Holmes. I am, in fact, quite curious about how Sir Arthur intends to wrest his hero from the watery grave. And just because I made some oblique suggestion, must you forthwith, forthwith believe I've pla pla painted a scarlet letter upon my forehead? I speak not just of Holmes. He came a hair breadth from... Galen cuts off Simon's next parry with a wave of his arm. Indeed, he said, anticipating. I must confess that his interrogation about my legendary ancestors unsettled me, as did his reference to that book. What if he has some knowledge of it, useful knowledge? God knows the trail was long since dried up, and he is, after all, a journalist, a rather clever one. You might wish to inquire further for what he knows. Galen slammed his fist into the arm of the chair. No, 
He knows no more than you or I. He was fishing, and that is all. There was no more to be said on the matter. Full stop. Simon grabbed the poker again, and sparks flared as he drove it deep into the hearth, his patience clearly at an end. Perhaps it is time for you to go. More than a week has passed since my sister's funeral, yet you are still here. Had you been so steadfast whilst Eleanor was yet living and breathing, she might have been happier, but because of your fear... Galen flinched, stung by the truth of Simon's words. But Simon, too, was grieving. Yes, he'd had no choice but to leave, but what of the intervening years? Might there have been an opportunity for a reunion with her? He sipped the last of the ganja tea and set down the cup. Clattering of iron startled Galen from his seat as Simon hurled the poker into its holder. You're a bit skittish tonight, I dare say, declared Simon. His voice was now devoid of all anger. Galen retreated to a far corner of the room, his back to Simon, mustering the scattered remains of his composure. Perhaps I was more unnerved by Sir Arthur than I considered. As for your sister, I could not stay in England at the time, and this you well know. He turned, now facing Simon, his enemy, his lone friend in the world. His combativeness dissipated as excuses failed him. Simon was right. He had to get away from Simon and from England, where too many memories haunted too near. Yes, you have a point, and perhaps it is time for me to reinvent myself, as it were. I think I'll repair to Scotland for a bit, perhaps Aberdeen. He could predict Simon's reaction before a word was more was spoken. Do not dare, Simon roared. Do not dare set foot anywhere near to Aberdeen. You shall bring my niece nothing but misery. Galen considered his limited options. I cannot go, I cannot go back to America, not now, and perhaps not for a long time to come. Why in the devil not? Galen dropped his voice to a bare whisper, sitting again. I was nearly discovered, and I fear there there was an accident, and I... I've never quite understood, Urkel Dune, Simon replied, pouring himself a cup of the tea. Why you yet live in the shadows, even now, well nigh a generation past the time anyone would care you to allude to the noose. You were certainly enough in plain sight tonight. It is not that sort of discovery, I fear, but I yet live in abject terror each time I spy an advertising poster for one of those wretched freak shows come to town. I hear they have all but vanished in America. Too distasteful. Indeed, that may be the case, yet not so much as you think. Galen had hoped to keep his temper in check. Simon was grieving for the last of his close free relations, yet how could the man be so obtuse? Galen sprang from his seat again, striding across the room, his hands clenched into the right tight fist before wheeling on his companion. Tell me, Bell, he said finally, his tone sharper than intended. What do you think would transpire should my condition, our condition, come to light? How can you not comprehend? The fortunes of war, the balance of power, world over, shall forever alter if one side or the other possesses such a secret, one to which we both hold the key. Galen seethed, but stopped before the discussion dissolved, devolved into vicious argument. Simon well knew that men with naught but greed in their hearts yet coveted the elusive elixir of life. Why then this shallow disregard for... <sighs> Galen fought against further provocation on the matter. He pinched the bridge of his nose, applying pressure to forestall the gnawing in his forehead. Do not worry, Simon. I shall not play the interloper in Aberdeen. This I promise you. Restless energy propelled Galen from one window to the next, despite the headache, as he paused at each but a, but a moment to look up into the starlit sky, hoping it might settle him. But I can and shall also know that my daughter and her family are happy, and at least observe, if only from afar, their accomplishments. How can you reckon what my heart yearns for and how it tears me to shreds, knowing I must live ever in exile from my grandchildren and great-grandchildren shall never feel their tiny hands ruffling my hair? He turned away. It is far too late for that, for all your words of regret. There would have been ways to manage it, as I have. Simon's harsh words hurt far worse than the cruelest physical torture. I had no choice, Galen insisted. And it is not also true that I saved her life. Perhaps I was a coward to stay away for so many years, but the very thought of discovery. It is only now, 60 years hence, that I feel safe to return here. The weight of solitary exile bore down on Galen's shoulders and crushed his throat until he was unable to breathe. Yes, Aberdeen would be a risk all the more now, since he had come face to face with his daughter, his dear Adrian, a woman who knew him solely as an acquaintance to her cousin, Simon. Yes, you speak the truth, and I have always been grateful for what you did for us both, 
regret suffused Simon's countenance. Nevertheless, the sight of you is more than I can stand, the representation of all I have lost, and now with Eleanor's death, she is the last, you know. I am as alone as you on this earth, despite what you might believe. I, I do know that, so let us drink to Eleanor a last time. Simon poured two tumblers. They drank down the fine scotch without another word. Galen peered into his empty glass. The emptiness and loneliness, the unrelenting pain that ever emanated from his disfigured left hand. A precipitous burden that threatened to crash down upon him. He strode to the mantelpiece and stopped scrutinizing the facets in his crystal tumbler before slamming it into the wood. It shattered, slicing into his hand. He watched the blood flow down his arm, darkening the ruffled shirt sleeve. I shall bid you a good night then. By morning, Galen was gone. <laughs>